Thank you and good morning. Um, Dr. Nozanin Yusuf Bekova, I'm the past president of the Hawaii Psychological Association. And I'm here with representatives from Hawaii healthcare industry and community advocates to talk about House Bill number 1980 and how it will hurt the people on the neighbor islands, the economically disadvantaged and the elderly. If a benefit is available under Medicare and Medicaid, shouldn't it also be required for private insurers? That is the question Hawaii legislature must answer when they vote on House Bill number 1980, conference draft one tomorrow. And the answer they're giving us is no. In its current form, House Bill number 1980 will effectively bar insurance reimbursement for behavioral health services provided through audio-only telephone communications. That means the landline telephone cannot be used to treat a patient. During the COVID-19 pandemic, restrictions were eased to allow for the standard telephone to be used. This was a huge relief for many people living on the neighbor islands and isolated communities, the economically disadvantaged and our kupuna, especially when primary care offices were shut down. In many cases, the standard telephone was the only lifeline available for people to receive help from healthcare providers. This was especially true for mental health. For standard talk therapy, audio-only communications work well in getting needed treatment to patients. Congress agreed and changed the rules for Medicare to allow standard telephones to be used for behavioral health services. Medicaid followed suit. So if you are 65 years and older or earn less than certain levels, public insurance will cover mental health services conducted over a landline telephone. Some private insurers do not seem to like it because they say it may cost too much. Some hospitals and other institutions do not seem to like it either because patients may not go in for office visits if they can get treated at home. But shouldn't it be about what is in the best interest of the patients? Lawmakers have the opportunity to do the right thing. The House of Representatives could agree to the Senate's version of the bill. The version would conform Hawaii's insurance code to what is allowed under Medicare. This would level the playing field and ensure that everyone will receive the same access to health care, regardless of your socioeconomic status, age, or place of residence in Hawaii. I will now turn it over to Eric to share his views. Mahalo. Hi, my name is Eric Abe. I'm the Public Affairs and Policy Director for the Hawaii Primary Care Association. The Hawaii Primary Care Association represents 15 federally qualified health centers providing medical services to 160,000 patients throughout the state. I'm also 55 years old. I am recently a member of AARP and I'm also an HMSA subscriber. Um, I want to just point out some things about this bill. Because House Bill 1980 Conference Draft 1 makes clear that a healthcare provider provided um, over a standard telephone line is not telehealth, the billing codes that apply for an in-person or telehealth service cannot be used when those services are provided over the telephone. Reimbursement cannot be given until new codes are approved, including the rates for reimbursement for services provided over the telephone. From a practical standpoint, it would probably take months, if not years, for these codes to be approved. Until then, no reimbursement could be given. In order for reimbursement to be allowed, the patient must see the provider in person during the previous 12 months. The way telehealth works is that the primary provider will evaluate the patient and refer the patient to a specialist if needed. Because there are few specialists on the neighbor islands, specialists are brought on by telehealth. That means a patient living on Molokai, Lanai, or the Big Island would need to fly to Honolulu before a specialist on Oahu could be reimbursed. The Primary Health Care Association is very concerned 
the conference draft one will force the state to stop reimbursement for telephonic telehealth services under Medicaid. Under this version of the bill, services provided over a landline phone would no longer be deemed telehealth in the Department of Human Services statutes. We don't know whether DHS will interpret this version to mean they no longer can allow reimbursement for telephonic telehealth. Now, speaking as a 55-year-old or old subscriber of HMSA, if the conference draft one is enacted into law, I will have to wait 10 years and become a Medicare recipient before I can get this benefit. Until then, I will need to obtain medical services over it. If I need to obtain medical services over a landline telephone, I will have to pay for it out of pocket. To me, why should I have to pay out of pocket for services that would be covered if I was 10 years older? If I was a Kaiser member, I wouldn't have to pay out of pocket. Same with Aloha Care and Medicaid. The legislature can fix this problem. They can recommit House Bill 1980 Conference Draft 1, and the House of Representatives can move to agree to House Bill 1980 Senate Draft 2 and approve it on final reading. The Senate Draft 2 would conform the insurance code to what is provided under Medicare. This version would level the playing field and ensure that telephonic telehealth will be covered regardless of whether where you live, how much you earn, and how old you are. Um, next, Alex, if you come in. Hi, I'm Alex Licken. I'm the legislative chair of the Hawaii Psychological Association. Here are some real life examples of how this uh, legislation would affect people. And forgive me if I read from an email that I received from another psychologist who cites an example of an elderly woman with multiple health conditions whose spouse also has uh, multiple health conditions. This person has never been familiar with computers or smartphones and is afraid to try. She used to come in person for her psychotherapy visits, but that became more difficult as she has to travel with her husband and with a collection of medical equipment, including a walker and extra batteries for her oxygen. It takes this person an hour to get out of the house and half an hour to get from the vehicle to the psychologist's office. When she could do phone sessions, she could stay at home with her husband. It would be devastating to her if this legislation passes in its current form. This person is already depressed, anxious, and overwhelmed, and would be at risk for a breakdown. Another example is a uh, middle-aged person who lives alone with very severe anxiety, uh, very severe depression, as well as anxiety. Although this person can use an, an iPad and phone, this person is terribly afraid of being on video uh, as they are uncomfortable with their physical appearance. This person is afraid to drive now. They are afraid of COVID. They are socially withdrawn and isolated. The phone sessions are their only link to care. Without phone therapy, this person is at risk for suicide or other self-harm. These are just two examples of the many hundreds of people that would be harmed if HB 1980 passes in its current form. I hope the legislature will act with human compassion. Good morning. I'm Jerry Boster. I'm the president of the Hawaii Parkinson's Association, and I have Parkinson's disease. The number one need for the estimated 7,000 Parkinson patients in Hawaii is access. Access to the right treatment, whether it's doctors, therapists, medications, or information. Most people recognize that Parkinson patients need treatment for their physical symptoms, very much like I, I take medicine for my, my tremors. What most people don't recognize is that 50% of Parkinson patients will suffer mental health challenges during their Parkinson journey. And when I say 50%, I include myself in that 50%. So I've had to deal with depression twice in my eight and a half year journey so far. I was fortunate to have strong support of my family and friends, as well as access to the resources, thanks to good insurance and the Veterans Administration. But not all my Parkinson brothers and sisters are as fortunate. 
Due to their geography and their economic situations, many of their treatment options are very limited. Having video and voice telehealth gives doctors and patients access to powerful treatment tools. Any legislation that artificially limits access to video or voice telehealth treatment is bad in my book. Patients need access to all treatment options, period. Who cares if it's via computer link or landline? Leave it to the doctors to figure that piece out, which treatment tools are the best and the best way to get the patients the treatment that they need. This is the legislation we need. We need not something that restricts ag access. I would ask that our elected state officials remember who this legislation should be about, us the patients, like me who need access to all the different treatment options. Mahalo for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Joy Quick with HIAM. I wanted to speak to you from my heart. We love these islands and we love the people who live here. The right thing to do is to make healthcare accessible and available for everyone, no matter where you live, rich or poor, employed, unemployed. If you want to do something about homelessness, provide more mental health services to people that are suffering. This is the right thing to do. Think about the heart of the matter. We care and we want health care services for all. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sonia Bagalki Bannon. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Social Workers Hawaii chapter. We're here today to really advocate for clients. Um, we have seen an increase in 25% in anxiety and depression post 2020, and um, the people that we're helping are, are really struggling. So we wanna ensure that they can continue to have access no matter where they live in the state, if they're in a rural area, if they're in an urban area, um, and, and if um, an age is a factor or disability is a factor, we wanna make sure that our clients can be comfortable receiving services the way that they prefer to receive services. We all practiced telephone therapy over the pandemic. It was one of the things we had to shift to do as part of you know, the changing nature of mental health care and how we responded. Um, and clients became used to that and it became a way that people could get services. Just because the pandemic is in a different phase doesn't mean that we should be shifting away from this ability to provide services for clients. We need to meet people where they are and use the type of services that they're comfortable with. Um, please don't make it harder to see clients and please make sure that we continue to have opportunities for folks to reach out however they feel is uh, comfortable for them when they're in crisis. Mahalo. Um, I've got like a couple of finer legal points that I could share. If anyone wants to get nerdy about this and take a look at the black letter, it's what's being proposed. I please invite anybody to um, correct me if my analysis is flawed in any way. Legislators, um, please ask your drafting agency's legal counsel to take a look at these questions. If this CD1 becomes law, and if an insurer wants to cover telephon telephonic treatments, it seems that this patient must first go to that provider in person, which is a barrier, as we've heard, for those who are disabled. They must also not even have a smartphone or a computer, nor adequate broadband. Very, very few patients can claim all of these conditions are always in place. So those are barring people. And by way of the joint reading of the definition of telephonic service, quote, telephonic service, and the second condition that it must be a, quote, covered service, and the practical reality that no insurance codes are yet available for quote telephonic services, it will be at least six months until codes are issued. I'm hearing much longer. And that would make telephonic treatment impossible during that time. Though those new codes, whenever they are finally issued, through those codes, insurers will then be authorized to reimburse at whatever rate they want. And no doubt that rate is going to be much lower and it's the same amount of the provider's time, same amount of effort. If a patient had always connected via Zoom, as many do and necessarily have through the pandemic and that Zoom connection drops, then the law requires that you can't use the phone because you never saw that provider in person first. Suicidal and needs and prefer to talk via phone, too bad, not covered.
the demand for mental health services skyrocketed from the pandemic. And all these people who are used to and prefer using the phone can't do that anymore until those codes are issued. This is a barrier to utilization. When sim simple tasks for people in crisis, in anxiety and depression are very, very hard. And this could further push them into relapse, desperation, and perhaps suicide. The consequences are dire. What about domestic violence victims trapped by abusive, controlling partners who control the computer, control the smartphone access, control every move of their intimate partner? I know this happens. Ask any woman they know someone that this happened to. They were ably, able to discreetly use the phone before to talk to therapists and get help. That won't be available to them anymore. Those with social anxieties, afraid to go anywhere in person and show their face on a Zoom, they have to overcome their fear first before, before they even get a chance to seek help overcoming that fear. Someone with a dis disability and depression and can't manually use the technology, i.e. Parkinson's, as we heard earlier today, they need to physically travel to that provider's office first. Even worse, if they don't have someone who can take them, forcing them to take a bus. Even worse, if they live in a rural area. Furthermore, there are no con connection speed thresholds outlined in this bill. So if it's a really poor, spotty connection that constantly freezes, which we see in rural areas, you only really manage to get about 20 frustrating minutes of therapy in your scheduled hour but you still have to pay for that whole hour. Exclusively remote therapy practices, like one of, one of the practices represented here with patients who live on other islands will lose all of their telephone patients because they won't ever be likely to meet them in person across deep ocean. This could put some very effective practices out of business when demand is so great. And as for non-behavioral health telephonic services, because of this new de definition in the CD1, all telephonic care is now blocked until codes are issued. Some say that could take years. So many barriers when the demand in need is so great and so many opportunities for insurers to limit costs. Unless insurers decide to lower premiums, this bill makes them a hell of a lot of money. Meanwhile, we are all subsidizing the federal public health plans, Medicaid, Medicare, that embrace parity of audio-only telehealth, giving those patients far better coverage than we can get from private plans. I'm taking a look at open enrollment, period. I can't subsidize this, not with my consumer dollar. With that, um, I, uh, I guess we'll just bid you all adieu and uh, encourage you to reach out to your legislators, encourage you to put everything you've got into this fight for your patients, for our souls, really. All of these uh, people here representing their professions, they all agree to an ethical obligation to treat their patients over the phone, even you know if, if they don't get that coverage. So this bill will essentially ask all of these people to work for free. They work for us. Hold up the signs. Hold up the signs. Hold up the signs. Okay, swell. 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 Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, and thank everybody that came out today. Um, it's just really wonderful to see passion, the fight that we all have. Uh, that you guys are doing right now. It's just incredible. So thank you so much. Please engage. Your okay. voice matters. Mental health matters. It's really painful to hear a testimony from somebody that is saying, this is going to affect me and this is how it's going to affect me. And these are just a few people. Um, they're not representing, you know, their entire population, but there are so many more that are in need of these services. And I hope you guys contact and reach out to your legislatures and talk to them. You know, I, I just hope everybody um, recognizes how important this is.